I think we're live. Good to go. All right. Well, we want to welcome everybody to uh, Pastor's Point of View. Today is September the 7th, 2018, and uh, my name is Dr. Andy Woods. I'm the pastor teacher uh, here at Sugarland Bible Church, and I'm back with my friend and colleague and fellow elder, Dr. Jim McGowan. And uh, welcome back to another exciting issue of Pastor's Point of View. It will be an exciting issue, yes. And I think we've got a barn burner today for folks. I think so. Uh, this show goes places that very few Christians <laughs> will want to go. Angels fear to <laughs> tread. Ex exactly. <laughs> That's how I feel about this one. <clears throat> and we're dealing today with the subject of ministry, integrity, and accountability. Right. Yeah. And how we as the Christian public need to demand that yeah. from anybody, even in our ministry, Absolutely right. that claims to speak for Jesus Christ. Yes. Why don't we start off with a couple of verses before we uh, give people the exact path we're going down. Uh, if you can uh, read 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. All right. 1 John 4 verse 1 coming from the New American Standard update. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So all of us, including us, any, anybody regardless of their popularity is, is accountable to the mm -hmm. Christian public for, yeah. for testing. That, that's right. And um, <clears throat> when you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8, That'll be slide number two. You'll see that the use of money and how it's handled is very important to God, mm -hmm. uh, yes. particularly God's money, particularly people that donate money to ministries, mm -hmm. uh, hardworking people. Yeah. So yeah. why don't you read that? All right. First Timothy three eight. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. So you don't put people in positions of authority in the church like deacons that are fond of sordid gain. Yeah. I like how the King James translates that filthy lucre. Filthy lucre, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting translation. Yes. So there is not just an accountability to, for ministers in terms of their theological content that they disseminate, but their use of funds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, if you take a look at slide three, um, we're talking today about John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the subject of John MacArthur, there's three entities that you need to think of. Number one, there is his church yeah. uh, called Grace Community Church. Mm -hmm. Number two, there is his radio ministry called Grace to You. Yeah. And number three, there's the school. And we used to play them in basketball when I was uh, at the University of Redlands. Um, we played them pretty regularly. The Masters Seminary and yep. the Masters University. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you bring up a subject like John MacArthur, um, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, my emotions are very mixed on mm -hmm. John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Uh, part of it is I, I really like a lot of the things John MacArthur has said over the years. Yes. I appreciate his stand on creation, mm -hmm. literal creationism. Yeah. He was one of the first that I can remember that took a stand against mixing Christianity with the Bible. I'm sorry, Christianity and the Bible with psychology yes. for purposes yes. of counseling. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was one of the first, he wrote a whole book about it, I think it was called Ashamed of the Gospel, mm -hmm. uh, where he took a stand against the seeker-friendly movement. Yes. And his school has a lot of people in it that I've regarded highly over the years. I could name a lot of people, but mm -hmm. one of my favorites is Dr. Robert Thomas. Oh, yes. He yes. wrote a phenomenal book on hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a two-volume set on the book of Revelation. Yeah. You know, that yeah, I would I have encourage. It. You have it, yeah. I do, yeah. And I, I wrote my dissertation on the book of Revelation. So I quoted from that, those two volumes, quite yeah. frequently. Yeah. Great work. However, what I think has happened to John MacArthur is he is, has changed over the years. And I believe that his ministry, to a large extent, is not trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably my first uh, inkling in this direction was uh, the book that he wrote called, uh, have it over here, The Gospel According to right. Jesus, yeah. 
where he trashed on page 75 and page 177 uh, a man that I actually graded for at Dallas Seminary, mm -hmm. Thomas Constable. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. you know, why did he trash him? Because Constable holds to a biblical definition of repentance, which right. is change of mind. Yeah rather than change of action. And yeah. we've done other shows on that, so we're not going to get into that yeah. subject. He, he trashed Charles Ryrie. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. He trashed the late Zane Hodges, who yes. I didn't agree with on every little thing, right. but I didn't feel he deserved to be publicly scolded. Mm -hmm. uh, he trashed uh, the founder of Dallas Seminary, Lewis Berry Chafer. Yeah. And once he started doing that and began to uh, publicly attack uh, men of God, mm -hmm. you know, I started to think that was a bridge too far, mm -hmm. despite some of the things that John MacArthur has done. And we actually have a video. Uh, we're going to put that up if we could real quick. It's uh, a video. It's put together. Before we play it, let me kind of give the uh, background of it. It's basically two snapshots of John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. A latter snapshot and an earlier snapshot. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with his uh, comments related to the Calvary Chapel movement. Yes. And I want folks to understand that when this video is played, he is going after not some of the latter changes in the Calvary Chapel movement under Brian Broderson that we, yeah. we've talked about on yeah. the show, yeah. but he's going after the foundation. <laughs> he's going after uh, Chuck Smith. Mm -hmm. So the, f the first part of the clip is latter things that he has said about Chuck Smith. Yeah, the most recent, right? Most recent, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's to be juxtaposed against what he once thought about yes. Chuck Smith. Which is interesting, which, very phenomenal. Yeah, very, yeah. yeah uh, you know, what he used to think about Chuck Smith yeah. as featured in their video, the Calvary Chapel video, mm -hmm. Ventures of Faith. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at those two snapshots, and I'm, it, to me it looks schizophrenic. To me, he's not being honest in one of these two snapshots. Mm -hmm. um, so which John MacArthur is it? Yeah. And I think this snapshot kind of demonstrates a change that's happened in his ministry. You know, I happen mm -hmm. to be have a very high opinion of the Calvary Chapels. I do too. I don't have to agree with them on everything to appreciate what God has done in their ministry. True. How they brought in expository teaching, mm -hmm. their premillennial, pre-tribulational, pro-Israel, dispensational, etc. Yeah. And notice what MacArthur says here, and notice this juxtaposition. You have a whole stream of people who are coming at the Scripture without regard for any other helps outside themselves or outside the limitations of their tradition. So you get a very skewed form of Christianity. Not only is it Arminian, which of course is wrong, but it's driven by experience and then therefore has a weak view of Scripture. That's the charismatic movement. By, by 1967, another dramatic change happens when a bunch of Jesus freak hippies in the beach areas of Southern California go to Calvary Chapel, which has 30 people, Chuck Smith, 30 people before long with Lonnie Frisbee uh, leading the parade. There's a thousand kids there and the church has, to, uh, has decided to absorb this and with it the culture. And for the first time, the church that I know of in history, the church lets this very defined subculture dictate what it will be. Out go the ties, out go the hymns, uh, out go all the normal and formal things, and and the the the, the hippie culture, the communal living, uh, you, know, you know, kids coming out of drugs and free sex and all of that—that that very casual thing—and that's a charismatic church. That's 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 a four-square church. So that's where the movement becomes what we know as Calvary Chapel. The market-driven church comes out of that charismatic world. It doesn't come out of Reformed theology. How does it come out of it? Because the first Calvary Chapel was essentially the church saying, we'll let the culture tell us what we need to be. And that set the thing in motion. And ever since then, the churches have rolled over to let the culture tell them what they need to be. I think today, so that's what I, that's what I would say. I could see the high priority of worship I, uh, and, and the low priority of entertainment. I was aware, because I attended some of the services, I just slipped in the back. 
Um, there wasn't a choir, there wasn't a soloist, nobody was featured. There was a humility to the whole thing. There was a focus toward God uh, that was very apparent to me. But at the time Calvary Chapel got started, um, you were on the very cutting edge of contemporary Christian music, very attractive. And now you have refined that to the point where it's still extremely popular um, and carries, I think, a great, great, um, it's a force in, in the life and experience and worship of the church. There's a very casual approach to the, I don't know what to say, to the style of the church. It's, it's I mean, obviously you guys aren't into ties and coats, and, but that only speaks of the fact that it, it, there's a lack of pretentiousness. There's, there's a, it's a low church. In fact, we would say in church history, it's, it's as low as the low church gets. And we don't mean low in the base sense, but low in a liturgy sense. It would be the antithesis of the Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox, the Episcopalian. You're at the other extreme, um, which, you know, is, is close to my comfort zone. I, I'm not a high church person. But I would say that's a distinctive. The, the, the ability to make anybody and everybody come in in any kind of clothing or any kind of situation in life and feel comfortable. From a theological standpoint, it, it sort of has an identity all its own. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a hybrid, I guess. Uh, I heard somewhere that Baptists think Chuck is a Pentecostal and Pentecostals think he's a Baptist. And so there's a certain amount of ambivalence uh, among people about exactly where it lands doctrinally. So it has sort of an identity all its own. But that's not to be, um, we're not to be surprised by that because there is a progression in history in the development of doctrine so that at every point in time in the history of the church uh, there is there are movements that have nuances of newness to them and freshness to them history is going to look back and see a guy with a mainline pentecostal background who became in some ways um, the crusader against where pentecostalism went All right, brother Jim. Well, what do you what do you make of that? It looks sort of schizophrenic. Yeah, it? yeah. I uh, I was just making myself some notes as I was listening to that, and one of the things I noticed was that in the very first clip, if he had stopped with the very first paragraph, I mm -hmm. probably would have been okay. Mm -hmm. But what he did was he made a very sweeping generalizations, very broad brush, and by doing that, he brought the Calvary Chapel churches in under the full blown charismatic Pentecostal umbrella. And the, one of the things that he was a little uh, disingenuous about, I think, is the fact that if you know anything about Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapels, mm -hmm. they were doing everything they could to pull the charismatic movement back toward being b biblicist, mm -hmm. You know, not that's why not, they separated from the vineyard. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's, it, it, Chuck Smith stood for biblical integrity, mm -hmm. and so I, I I felt like his comments were like you know he really used a broad mm -hmm. brush there. Mm -hmm. so. so in the first clip <clears throat> is is more of a modern teaching. I think that was given at his Strange Fire conference yeah. or right around that time period, right. where right. he's basically saying they're compromisers and all these kinds of things, yeah. and then. There he is back in 1992, you know, being featured in the video Ventures of Faith, being mm -hmm. interviewed by Calvary Chapel, where he's praising them. Yes. So, you know, you wonder which of these guys should we believe. It's very schizophrenic. Yes, it is. And uh, mm -hmm. either he's being dishonest in one of them, or what I'm more inclined to is there's been a change in his ministry, mm -hmm. where he and those associated with him are essentially setting themselves up as judge, jury, and executioner of the body of Christ. Mm. And you notice how he keeps in the first clip mentioning Reformed theology. Yes, I did. You have to toe the line on mm -hmm. Calvinism, lordship salvation, mm -hmm. or you're outside the fold, yeah. you see. Yeah. And uh, here's kind of the point I want to make uh, as we progress here. It's something, you know, that all of our parents told us. If you're going to throw stones, look out. Make sure you're not in a glass house. That's right. And if you're going to set yourself up as this kind of authority over the body of Christ, yeah. and you're going to criticize <clears throat> men of God, like Charles Ryrie, like Chuck Smith, etc., 
then your own house better be in order. That's very true. And what I yeah. want to show people today, what we want to show people today, is their house is not in order. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Doctrinally, we're not even going to get into that subject. We're yeah. just getting into the issue of integrity mm -hmm. and ethics and um, accountability. And I believe that what God is doing is He's pulling back the veil and He's really allowing us to see what's happening in that ministry. Yeah. And I think the reason God does this is the same reason He gives us negative examples and positive examples to yeah. follow in mm -hmm. Scripture. Yes. You know, there's people to imitate, but as you look at Solomon's life towards the end, mm -hmm. you see a deterioration. That's true. And I think that same kind of thing's happening now as a negative example for us not to follow. So right. I'm not here uh, necessarily to speak with anger against John MacArthur. I'm here to say this, there go I but for the grace of God. There you go. Yeah. That's right. And these are That's examples right. that we need to be aware of. And we need to learn from them. Learn from them. That's what yes. I'm trying to get at. Yes. Uh, I'm the president of a small school, Chafer Seminary, mm -hmm. and there's a lot for me to learn on what not to do right. by looking at some of the examples we're going to reveal. I'm also a pastor of a church. Yeah. There's some examples of what not to do yeah. by looking at what's happened to the latter mm -hmm. uh, ministry of John MacArthur. Now, yes. if you're one of those people that's a uh, MacArthur acolyte, you might want to just turn this video off now. Okay. In fact, we have a quote there, don't we? A, a uh, yes. screenshot of a tweet by Justin Peters, who himself has done some good too, but he is lockstep with MacArthur. And would you read that second, uh, I guess, third sentence of his tweet there after the two question marks, uh, where it begins with MacArthur? Yeah. MacArthur has done more to champion sound doctrine, expository preaching, and equip pastors than probably anyone since the apostolic age. And that's, and that's how a lot of people look at John MacArthur. Yeah, wow. He's done more than anybody <laughs> since the apostles. So if that's your mentality, uh, then you're not going to look critically and honestly, intellectually honestly, about some of the things yeah. that are happening now yeah. in MacArthur's ministry. Right. So we're going to expose some of those things today, and I wanted to lay that foundation. And I want people to also understand this. All of the references that we're going to make are not to hearsay, mm -hmm. uh, tabloid journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. These are actually legal documents. Yeah. And uh, there's really two issues here, an accreditation issue. Mm -hmm. And there's something called the WASC report. We'll yes. explain that. It's a formal document. And it's also based on some of the, some of our comments are based on some of the 990s, I think you call them, that nonprofits are obligated to fill out, mm -hmm. which are there for public consumption. Mm -hmm. So all the information mm -hmm. that we're going to reveal today yeah. is basically available to the public for anybody that wants to take right. a look at it and read it. But let's talk about this first issue, and this is the accreditation issue. Uh, let me give you some vocabulary here so people know what we're talking about. There's something called the WASC report. WASC stands for Western Association of Law Schools and Colleges, and it's available online. And there's something called the WSU C, which stands for the Western Senior College University Commission. And there's something called the AVT. And when you see AVT in this document, it stands for Accreditation Visitation Team. And as we kind of flash forward real quick through slides 5 through 8, um, you'll see the WASC cover letter. Uh, actually, there's two parts to that cover letter, and there's sur surrounding signs called the WASC report. And you say, well, what is all of that about? It has to do with a visit that WASC made to the Master's Seminary and the Master's University on March 21st through 23rd, 2018. Now, who is WASC? WASC is the group that gives accreditation. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the master's university and the master's seminary. And um, essentially what happened is after this visit, they decided to take the school of John MacArthur 
and to put it on probation mm -hmm. for some major issues that we're going to talk about here. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that their accreditation is gone forever, mm -hmm. but it's on a probationary status right. unless they make some real changes. Yeah. And the changes they need to make, in my opinion, are very problematic because they go, they, I think they dishonor the Lord. Yeah. Uh, they dishonor His Word. And they basically bring down, in my opinion, the standards of the entire Christian uh, public. Yeah. So they have published this report, uh, which you can find online. It came out August 21st, uh, excuse me, August 16th, 2018. Mm -hmm. And then John MacArthur gave a chapel message address responding to this report. August 21st, 2018, which you can also find online. I think we we're going to post some links to that chapel address. <clears throat> and then the folks at WASC, for example, the president uh, essentially responded in the Santa Clarita News, I think is the name of that, and the president responded to MacArthur's chapel address November 4th, 2018. So those are the sources that we're drawing from as we present this material. Yeah. So there were a number of troubling things that the WASC people flagged at the Master Seminary and University. Uh, the first one, if we could put up slide number nine. And while we're doing that, please, let me just make a quick please, comment please, here. Please. I, I want people to understand that as we sit here and we're talking about this, uh, this grieves our hearts to see that this is happening. And, uh, you know, we're not here to bash. We're, we're here to report the information that's already been made available. We're mm -hmm. just reporting the information. And we're saying we need to all be very careful when we and we need to look at ourselves and say, like you said, mm -hmm. but for the grace of God, there go I. Yeah, I mean, these are so, learning examples. Yeah, it's learning examples. Uh, uh, teaching moments. Yeah. <clears throat> but the first thing they flagged, if you can put up pay, uh, slide number nine, it would be page six of the WASP report. There was an anonymous email system that was instituted where people within the institution and or institutions could freely express themselves without reprisal. Mm -hmm. And the WASC people found an abnormal number of employees and staff were disgruntled. Mm -hmm. So would you mind reading that section there? Right. And everything you see uh, on the screen is essentially screenshots of this WASC report. Right. Yes, uh, the underlined section is what I'm reading here. The AVT received... And that stands for Accreditation Visitation Team, as we've said. Yes. They uh, received before and during their visit significant confidential email input from the community, which became part of the data that were reviewed. Okay, so here come these emails. And would you mind reading slide 10? I think that's page 39 of the report. All right. So it says here, what became even more clear to the team was the need for systematic change across the institution referenced in prior reports has escalated significantly and now is a substantial issue for the institution to resolve in order to align with WSCUC standards. And then he says, many other items came to the team's attention through document and communication review. The on-site visit and the extraordinary volume of emails received by the team. There is a high level of concern over the volume of personal transactions since the last review, particularly in the year prior to the institutional review and WSCUC team visit. So the point I want to draw your attention to is it says there the extraordinary volume extraordinary, of e yeah. emails. Yeah. And it said that on the prior, the prior slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, <clears throat> John MacArthur in his chapel address to the students tried to respond to this. Um, and he talks about only 40 complaints were filed out of 15,000 people that were given access to the email. And the president of WASC uh, responded to MacArthur's chapel address mm -hmm. in the Santa Clarita News. And she says this, um, MacArthur is quoted as saying, I was really surprised there was a, wasn't a hundred complaints. Yeah. But the president of WASC comes back and she says the anonymous email account that is set up 
per standard procedure for any school, the AV team generally visits averages a far lower number than 40. In other words, 40 was abnormally high in terms <clears throat> mm -hmm. of complaints. And would you mind reading the, her quote there? Yes. Quoting, we received more than 35 messages to a confidential email address in response to our request for comments and concerns about the master's university and seminary, said Studley. A typical response for an institution under review would be about, here it is, five messages. Yeah. Ad and you want me to go on and read the rest of that? Sure, please. Additionally, while the number of complaints sent to the anonymous email was already considered high, that number does not include the allegations that were made during the in-person staff and faculty interviews conducted by AVT, according to Studley. See, the first, the first mm. disinfectant is light. Mm. You've got to bring things out into the open. Right. <clears throat> and when they came to Masters to, you know look at this anonymous emails that staff were allowed to send in without reprisal. Number one, there was an abnormally high number of complaints. Right. And beyond that, didn't even account for the face-to-face -face complaints that were made yeah. once the accreditation team was actually on campus. Yeah. So that's really the first thing to call people's uh, <clears throat> attention to. The second thing that you find in this report is a huge volume of personnel transit transitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a number of people quitting, leaving, or being fired that is abnormally high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a business major myself. I was a business management major. Uh, and that's one of the first things they teach you is when you're going into an organization and there's very, very high turnover, that's a sign that that organization is problematic. Yeah or in trouble or something, you know, is going askew. And yeah. if we can put up, uh, let's see, slide number 11, take a look, if you could, at page 9 of that WASP report, slide number 11. Here's what it says. However, we express concern that with the volume of personnel transitions that have taken place in the last 12 to 24 months, that the institution appears to have little continuity or institutional knowledge regarding accreditation standards and requirements. So you've got massive personnel transitions within the last 12 to 24 wow. months. Yeah. Uh, this is all part of the official what WASH indictment. report. Now, mm -hmm. if you take a look at slide number 12, which mm -hmm. is page 19 of the WASH report, it talks about how a lot of these personnel changes have taken place at the highest executive levels. Mm -hmm. Would yes. you mind reading that? The institution sustained significantly high turnover in the executive management level as well as many staff positions. The AVT was informed and observed there is a culture and climate of fear, intimidation, bullying, and uncertainty which was ascribed to the newly appointed management team. Further reports from the confidential emails raised notable concerns, including the potential for lack of fidelity to a number of key policies, including the Whistleblowers Act. Now, some of that stuff about bullying, the Whistleblowers <clears throat> Act, we're going to come back to. But for the time being, I just want to call folks' attention to uh, the very high turnover at the executive management level. Yeah as well as many staff positions. So immediately you know something isn't right. Something's not right. No. Because A, a lot of people chimed in through anonymous email mm -hmm. uh, when they figured out they, there couldn't be a reprisal. Yeah. Uh, number two, you've got this massive turnover taking place mm -hmm. there. And this really leads to a third problem that the report surfaced is a lack of faculty independence. And this is very important to understand because in academia, there is something called uh, academic freedom, mm -hmm. where professors, mm -hmm. as long as they're within the doctrinal statement, you know, are free to express what they want, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't be afraid of being bullied, they shouldn't be afraid of losing their jobs. And the WASP report started mm -hmm. to surface that those kind of things are lacking mm -hmm. at the master's university yeah. and uh, seminary. Uh, if you take a look at slide number 13, I think it is, we have 
uh, page 23 of the report. Would you mind reading that? Right. Here goes. This is what they discovered. They said they noted some concerns of faculty and staff regarding a top-down approach to decision-making, bypassing established policies, procedures, and standards. And it says the staff were afraid to speak up to their senior leaders and said that this provide, they provided documentation the authors believed demonstrated that those who spoke up to senior leaders were subsequently terminated. <laughs> so you've got a lot of people that are afraid to say anything yeah. for, for fear of termination, yeah. afraid to speak up. <clears throat> now, this is not hearsay. This is what the official this, report this concluded. Is the report. Yeah. Um, beyond that, related to faculty independence, you don't have any standard criteria for dismissals. You know, we even here at Sugarland Bible Church have a termination policy. Mm -hmm. You have to go through procedures right. before you terminate people. And apparently that is either lacking at the school or schools or it's not followed. Uh, can we put up slide number 14? Uh, page 11 of the report, would you mind reading that? All right, the report says, Concerns emerged for the AVT about the lack of boundaries between dual roles of some key institutional leaders. Multiple reports were provided to the AVT that several persons were believed to have been dismissed from faculty roles for reasons of lack of fit with theological values that were not explicitly outside stated theological standards. While these could not be thoroughly investigated as part of this review, the volume of comments and specific details provided leave a concerning question of whether academic freedom exists <laughs> and whether there is institutional autonomy from external entities. So in other words, you're dismissed and they just <clears throat> give you this nebulous excuse, lack of fit. Yeah. You're <clears throat> not a team player. Uh, they don't give you any clear documentation in terms of what part of the doctrinal statement you violated. Right. And you see, folks, here's the reality of the situation. Any school or Christian institution is going to have within it uh, disgruntled people. Mm -hmm. What is being unearthed here, though, by the WASP report concerning the master's university and seminaries, this is a climate. Yes. It's a climate what of, they call it. of fear. Yeah. Um, and take a look at, uh, let's see, I think that would be slide number, uh, what did we just read, 14? Yeah. Slide number 15, and this has to do with no standardized criteria for hirings, terminations, demotions, promotions, or even regular evaluations. Now, I worked at an accredited Bible college for seven years. We had uh, regular evaluations twice mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. That was something that was not optional. It was mandatory. It right. was obligatory. If you wanted to look into my file at that particular school, you'd see a whole file there and mm -hmm. how I was evaluated, not just by the my uh, uh, supervisor, mm -hmm. but by the students mm -hmm. uh, basically two times a year. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's stunning to me to read this report and discover that that type of thing was hardly happening at the master's university and seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is basically standard operating procedure for yeah. accredited schools that's being violated here. What were we on? Slide number uh, 15? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you read that? All right. In campus interviews and confidential emails, the ABT received clear and concerning reports of recent personnel actions, that is, hirings, terminations, promotions, demotions, and a lack of regular evaluations that have the appearance of seemingly arbitrary actions. While it is possible that the lack of clarity in some of these cases may be due to requirements related to confidentiality, the sheer number of these cases and the depth of issues provides cause for concern. This, coupled with the finding of a pervasive culture and climate of fear, that's the second time they said yes. climate of fear, mm -hmm. uh, intimidation, bullying, and uncertainty, which appears to be created by the newly appointed management, provides significant areas of concern regarding sound and ethical business practices. These concerns were exacerbated for the AVT by significant community member reports of the fear of speaking up despite protections of a whistleblower policy. Mm -hmm. So there's the lack of standard <clears throat> criteria in all of these, uh, all of these areas. Mm. Uh, one of the other things, if we can go to slide 16, 
uh, which would be page 15 of the uh, report, mm -hmm. is the staff and the faculty are filled with a disproportionate number of master's grads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things you can't be doing in academia for accredited schools is you can't be inbred. Right. Uh, right. You can't have groupthink. Right. Uh, as long as folks are within <laughs> the doctrinal statement, uh, there has to be demonstrated a diversity of people within mm -hmm. the faculty mm -hmm. having degrees from different institutions. Yeah. And you don't have that going on at the master's university and seminary. Would you read, mind reading slide number 16? All right. Here, the report goes on and says, Also of note is the number of faculty who are alumni of the master's university and seminary. The lack of diversity of experience and thought in conjunction with the limited engagement with professional development professional organizations, and academic presentations in non-master's uh, seminary uh, and university sectors is contrary to the expe expectation that faculty will have robust engagement with the profession and enhance their ability to keep curriculum and practices current and comparable to other institutions students might consider. Yeah, and take a look at slide 17. <clears throat> pages 19 and 20 of the report, it pretty much surfaces the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, going on. Specifically, during the accreditation review interviews, information emerged that employment opportunities are typically posted within the master's university website without listing jobs with external professional entities. Through the on-site review, it became apparent that a significantly large portion of the faculty and staff are graduates of the university and or the seminary. And the rigorous selection process cited by recent hires as seminary faculty led to follow-up questions by the AV team members. This selection process was found to be a one-hour interview. While there is full support for hiring for institutional and missional match, unless future hiring practices intentionally focus beyond the master's university and seminary students and alumni and Grace Community Church parishioners, the expected diversification will likely not occur. The lack of diversity has been a repeated finding uh, in the review and it requires attention, they say. Yeah, so the same wow. kind of thing. Same thing. Lack of standardization, <clears throat> uh, not following procedure, yeah. jamming our own people in there, mm -hmm. regardless of criteria, which apparently they don't even they don't even want to follow. It's frightening. Um, beyond that, you'll notice that in what was it slide number? I think it was sixteen. We don't have to go back to that, but it made reference to the lack of faculty enrichment. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. In other words, the way a school under accreditation is supposed to function is the school is supposed to allow its faculty to go to conferences. Right. In many cases, it will fund the <clears throat> trip and admission mm -hmm. so that, you know, as iron sharpens iron, uh, yes. you can be around colleagues and have your ideas refined. Right. And what you find with the master's seminary and university is faculty enrichment is almost something that doesn't even exist, according to the WASH report. Yeah. Would you mind reading, uh, I think it's slide number 18, page 16 of the report? All right, the report says, yet by 2018, faculty scholarships, our scholarship has shown limited growth with most publications coming from seminary faculty whose work is accepted in the institution's theological journal. While this is a good start, the lack of publication in independent, blind, peer-reviewed venues, a higher education standard, and being published primarily by one's institutional colleagues remains an area of concern. Support for faculty professional development is cited in the faculty handbook and referenced in the self-study. Yet there is limited evidence of regular support for faculty engagement in professional development, with some reports of freezes on faculty travel and book funds due to fiscal challenges at the institution. Further widespread reports of decreased financial support to the library adds to the concerns for successful faculty and student scholarship resources. See, when you read all this stuff, you, you understand why all of these faculty chimed in on the anonymous uh, email yeah, account. Exactly. Um, 
Beyond that, uh, well, why don't you read, uh, I think it's slide number 18. Uh, it teaches basically the same thing. I'm sorry, that was slide number 18. Page, uh, slide yeah, number 19, 19 page right. 18. Thank they you. go on and it says, uh, faculty workloads often do not allow sufficient time for professional growth, research, and scholarship. And, and on-site reports were that resources for books and travel had been frozen in response to fiscal issues. Without time and resources for faculty growth, the institution's ability to evolve with the changing educational landscape, advancements in technology, educational objectives, academic policies, integrity of its programs, and quality of delivered education may falter in the future. Moreover, reports of insufficient time for professional development, research, and scholarship suggest the need for additional faculty in order to meet uh, current needs. Yeah, same, same stuff. Same thing. Yeah. Beyond that, there's a problem with the faculty salaries. Um, you wonder mm -hmm. where all the money's going. It certainly is not going towards the faculty. Would you mind reading slide 20, page 20 of the WASP report? All right. This says that data evidences lower me evidences lower median salaries when compared to peer groups in Southern California faith-based schools for faculty and staff. So the salaries are below the median. Below the median. Below yeah. average. Below yeah. average. So mm -hmm. what I'm getting at here is you've got an issue with faculty independence. And I have a mm -hmm. high regard, as I said before, for some of the faculty there. Yeah. Uh, you've got an issue with an, a large amount of contributors to this anonymous email system mm -hmm. for the AV team that are disgruntled. Yeah. You've got these massive personnel trans, trans, uh, transitions taking yes. place. Big uh, beyond that, you've got, and this, is, this one surprised me, dual areas of responsibility with the church. So keep in mind, you've got Grace Community Church, and mm -hmm. then you've got the school. Yes. And what you discover mm -hmm. is people are working at both. Mm -hmm. So what if you voice your opinion at the school? Mm -hmm. Well, you could get punished at the church. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so this is a way that they've used to kind of quell dissenting opinion. And yeah. the, the WASP report surfaces this, uh, slide number 21, mm -hmm. pages 11 and 12 of the report. Do you mind reading that? Notable, uh, notably, significant portions of the faculty and staff have dual relationships with institutional leaders, as many worship at Grace Community Church, where President MacArthur has been the senior pastor since 1969, in addition to working at the university or seminary where he is president. Further, a number of cabinet-level leaders of the university and seminary are also on staff at Grace Community Church. Consequently, employees' higher education supervisors can also be their pastoral staff members. Some interviewees noted that lives were so intertwined that should they be dismissed or leave the university over a substantial difference of opinion, they lost their entire support community as a uh, seminary or university university alumni and employees, as well as congregants in Grace Church. Can you read that phrase again, beginning with some interviewees? Some interviewees noted that lives were so intertwined that should they be dismissed or leave the Master's University over a substantial difference of opinion, they lost their entire support community. So, <laughs> voicing disagreement at the school meant potential punishment at the church. Yeah, that's right. See, folks, this is how to not run mm -hmm. a ministry. And I think mm -hmm. this is all good education for us, is it not, mm -hmm. Brother Jim, and what we are not to do. Yeah, amen. Uh, now, the board of a school is supposed to be independent. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be filled with a bunch of yes, yes men. Right. And what you discover in this WASC report is that the board is not independent at all. Uh, can you read, if you don't mind, uh, slide number 22, page right. 12 of the report? Further in... And, and folks, oh. don't get mad at us for this stuff. Oh, that's right. Uh, this is exactly what the WASP report yeah. says. Here's the report. Yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead. All right, so here's what the report says. Further, in conversation with members of the board, the AVT developed concern that the board's statements of extraordinary confidence in President MacArthur have resulted in less oversight of the administration than is expected, especially in a period of significant flux as has recently occurred. Board members stated unequivocally that they could say no to the president, but could not identify any occasions on which they actually had done so and self-identified as President MacArthur's closest friends in the world. And with at least one board member, uh, or rather board leader, also serving as the associate dean and adjunct faculty of a regional site, and other board members serve as adjunct uh, faculty, that is, the presence of competing roles became evident. Yeah, so, yeah, we're friends. Yes, we can say no. Can you ever give us a time when you did say no to John MacArthur and they can't come up with a single can't think time? think of one. Now, when you look at, this is very indicting here, slides 24, 25, and 26. These are their 990s. And what does this show? It shows that the board members are being paid. Uh, here's Stephen Lawson. I'm looking at slide 24, receiving $50,000. If you go to slide number 25, I'm seeing, uh, I think his name's Tim Pennington, who is a pastor uh, out in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, mm -hmm. receiving close to $17,000 from the school. DeCourcy, a famous preacher, receiving $17,000. If you look at slide number 26, <clears throat> uh, you see the same type of thing as mm -hmm. Pennington, uh, DeCourcy, Steve Lawson, uh, who's sort of a famous Calvinist today, um, they're all being paid. Now, can I just ask a very simple question, Brother Jim? How in the world is the board of a school <clears throat> supposed to be independent when they're receiving sums of money from the school? Excellent question. I mean, I'm just asking the question okay. here. Okay. And, it needs uh, to be asked. Here's the thing, folks. When you are making out a check for a ministry, you need to approach that like you're making an investment. Yes. You wouldn't make an investment in the natural world unless you knew exactly about that company, that corporation, mm -hmm. the profit margin, the balance sheet, the yeah. debt the company has, its product, etc. Yeah. Uh, you would never do that. And we need to start doing this relative to money that we send to any ministry, including Amen. our ministry. That's right. You need to start doing some homework and research and figuring out these things. Yes. How is this money being spent? And right. the problem is so many people are following somebody because they're popular. That's right. That they're not doing, you know, yeah. their homework. Yeah. And so well, those, people generally want to believe, you know, they, they just they want to look at someone and think, well, they're a good guy. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're called to a higher standard. Than yeah. That. And, you know, uh, we're not even talking here about a church, mm -hmm. although there's some crossover. Yeah. This is not a church being run this way. This was this is a school yeah. that wants accreditation. And, you know, if you want to run your school like a despotic kingdom, I guess it's your right to do that. But don't hold yourself out as an accredited institution. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, this is all important stuff to understand. Yes. The WASC report also surfaced favoritism in tuition rates uh, at uh, the Master's University and mm -hmm. Seminary. And could you take a look at slides 27, mm -hmm. and then we'll read uh, uh, slide number 28. These, I think, are both from page 13 of the WASC report. All right, the report says, one significant exception emerged relative to the late fall of 2017 announcement that tuition rates would be recalibrated to more accurately reflect the cost of attendance, including the tuition discount rate. Thus, tuition rates were substantially redu reduced and the discount rate simultaneously reduced to a greater degree in the process, similar to other institutions moving to some version of this practice. Yet, the Master's Seminary or Master's University students noted that this change was announced in chapel as a tuition cut and they only later learned that approximately one-third of the student body would experience a reduction 
intuition, while the remaining two-thirds would either see no change or find that their net tuition costs were higher than before. This lack of transparency resulted in significant parent and student concerns. You got to give tuition mm -hmm. breaks or tuition rates across the board. Yeah, you, you can't. Now yeah. it, it gets worse when you look when you look at slide twenty eight. Notice yeah. what it says. And tell, let me know if you're getting tired of reading. I'm great. I can read a little bit myself, but you're doing such a wonderful <laughs> job. All right, this is the next the same section, same topic here. The AVT noted with concern the auditor finding that multiple students who are family members of donors or related parties at the Master's University and Seminary received institutional aid, which appeared to be above what is typically offered to all students and is an inconsistency in awarding, according to the current policy. Uh, this is troubling both for students without such connections, but also as a matter of integrity with donor tax-exempt donations and financial aid practices. The lack of timely responsiveness to auditor reports is concerning. So if you're a donor family or connected to a donor family, you get a special break on the tuition that other people <clears throat> don't mm -hmm. get. Yeah. Uh, should, all, should this be happening in the name of Christ is, I guess, what I'm trying to, to ask. Um, beyond all of these things, and we've already talked a little bit about this, the WASP report, and this, of all the things mentioned, this probably to me is the most disturbing. Mm -hmm. It surfaced a climate of what it calls bullying. Yeah. And if you take a look at slide 30, pages 13 and 14, uh, some of this uh, we've already read before, but it says right there in the middle, this coupled with the findings of a pervasive culture. Now, I want you mm -hmm. to underline mentally that word culture. Yes. And climate, and mentally underline yep. that, yep. of fear, intimidation, bullying, mm -hmm. and uncertainty. Uh, and the line goes on, yep. and I won't repeat <laughs> it because we've already read it. Take a look at slide 31, if you could. Uh, this would be page 19 of the report. All right. The hiring practices for several key management positions neglected responsible observance of the institution's policies or best practice guidelines. Positions were simply appointed rather than advertised without any form of search process conducted. Job descriptions and qualification standards for the positions were not established prior to the appointment of several key management positions. A number of those appointed to cabinet-level roles had no prior experience in the area represented by their new assignments. And in interviews, it became evident that few of the senior leaders were actively engaged in the professional higher education associations relative to their particular areas of responsibility. Yeah, and then when you go down to pages 26 and 27, uh, this would be slide number 32. Um, would you mind reading that? All right. Recently, many alumni expressed concern over the directional shifts taking place at the Master's Seminary's campus and within the leadership team. Systems, structures, and programs are in place to facilitate the gathering and dissemination of key data. However, staff and faculty represented that while people may be invited to provide or to yeah to provide voice to their process, their voice isn't utilized, and there is strong belief that senior administration will operate independently of constituent input. In the context of reports of staff and faculty reports of not feeling heard or valued and significant reports of the master's university and seminary being an environment of intimidation and fear, the strategic planning and future success of the institution may be jeopardized if voices are silenced. See where it keeps mentioning an environment of intimidation and an <clears throat> environment of fear. Yes. Um, as I tried to mention before, this yeah. this appears to be a climate there, yeah. yeah, not an occasional disgruntled person, no. which you have in any organization or institution. Right. And John mm. MacArthur made a response to this report to the students mm -hmm. in his chapel address, August twenty first, two thousand and eighteen, which you can find online, which I encourage you to listen to. 
I listened to it very carefully because I wanted to give the man the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't really convinced at all related to his answer because he didn't really respond to the specific allegations. Yeah. Uh, what he says there in the 20 minute mark, someone said to me, why did we have to find out about this <laughs> probationary status on Facebook? MacArthur says, I'm going to be on real honest with you. You don't have any right to find out about anything. That's yeah. not your responsibility. Hmm. About 15 hmm. seconds later, he says, the assumption of this culture that you're supposed to know anything, the assumption of this culture is you're supposed to know anything you want to know. Well, I, I think the students do have a right Absolutely. to know they're, what's they're going on. They're paying to go to school there. Paying the, paying the tuition. Paying for a service so, and a So to me, that's an example of bullying. It certainly is. And silencing uh, opposition. <clears throat> yes, it is. Uh, this chapel address gets worse and worse. He mm -hmm. blames the whole thing on Satan. Mm -hmm. The enemy is working hard. Yeah. Now, I, I get that. Satan does work hard to derail people. Mm -hmm. But the, the issue is... The Bible teaches we can give Satan an inroad through our bad choices. It does. Uh, Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27 mm -hmm. talks about that. And then MacArthur starts quoting the scripture, how people ought to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Um, he, you know, he's, In other words, he's using the scripture to silence opposition. Right, right. Um, he's talking about how the whole thing was aimed directly at him. This mm -hmm. is an attack against him. Yeah. He uses the scripture about stirring up strife. He says, keep your mouth shut or else you're violating the scripture, I guess, yeah. in his mind. Yeah. Um, he talks about how some folks need some spiritual shepherding. I guess those would be the dissenters. Yeah. Uh, he attacks the motives of people bringing these criticisms. He says, who has the most to gain? Yeah. Um, he talks about it being a coup. Yeah. He again quotes the book of Proverbs, hatred stirs up strife. He accuses people of trying to tear down what God has built. <clears throat> uh, he talks about it's another an attack on him. You know, it's sort of an, a mutiny. He quotes 1 Corinthians 6. He blames about 38 minutes into this. He starts to blame the whole thing on the Internet. Yeah. You know, that pesky Internet that made yeah. people aware of all of these things. Right. So, you know, when someone's standing up and not addressing the specific allegations and selectively using the Scripture in a way to silence legitimate dissent, is that not a culture of bullying and fear and uh, intimidation. Yeah, Pastor, I, I, I'm sorry, but I have to just interject something Please, here. Yes. As I'm listening to you read this, I'm going back in my memory. I'm an old guy, and I, I have a long memory. And you know where I remember hearing these very exact type of expressions? I remember hearing Jimmy Swaggart say these things. Mm -hmm. You know who else I remember hearing? I, I remember hearing Jim Baker say these very same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Satan, it's this, it's that, you know, not taking any responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? John MacArthur's the head of this this entity, mm -hmm. this church, this university, this seminary. Mm -hmm. The buck stops with him. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's sort of a case where God is using a secular institution to discipline his people. Well, he like will. He, like he did with uh, Swaggart, Baker, oh, yep. and just like he used Babylon yep, you know, right. to discipline oh, yes. Judah oh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. back in the 6th century. Yep. Now, some something uh, folks out there, Brother Jim, may not know about you, you were in the Word of Faith movement for almost 20 years. Almost 20 years, yeah. And as I was sharing some of these things with you, you said, I've heard some of that stuff yep. when I used to that's, be in the Word of Faith that's movement. That's exactly right. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit? Well, one of, the, one of the things that was very prominent when I was involved in the movement was a very authoritarian structure. So you would hear constantly the psalm quoted, you know, touch not my prophets, and, or touch not my, my anointed, anointed, and yeah. do my prophets no harm. Mm -hmm. And this, this was sort of used as a blanket statement that, you know, the man at the top, you know, he's next to God. And so you don't dare question anything that's said. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm hearing the same kind of tenor tone to this 
uh, whole John MacArthur situation here. And I remember people uh, in our church, I had many, many friends that mm -hmm. were devastated by things that happened in the church because, you know, if you dared to voice any opposition, if you even questioned, you know, came with a humble heart and questioned the authority, you know, you were ostracized. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing as I read this is it's just bringing all that back to me, mm -hmm, the very mm -hmm, same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I'm hearing, Brother Jim, is when you study John Calvin, and these people are ironclad Calvinists, yeah. he ran Geneva oh, with yes, an, like a despot yes, he did. with an iron fist. Yeah. And I'm seeing some of that mentality oh, come yeah. out here yeah. in the running of these institutions. I agree. And I, I want folks, whether you agree with our report on this or not, I want you to understand something. Uh, Jesus Christ is not about fear, bullying, and intimidation. Amen, brother. You know, in fact, Second yeah. Corinthians three and verse seventeen says, "Where the Spirit of the Lord is, yes. there yes. is liberty." Yes. And in any school or church you go into, there's always going to be problems because people are there. And as long as we still have a sin nature, yeah, that's right. There'll be problems. Right. But the reality is, there should not be a endemic. Mm -hmm. uh, climate of these kinds of things right, right and if you sense that going on in your church or in a school uh you can you can automatically determine that the holy spirit is not involved with those kinds of things well that's the reason why when you go about selecting your board yes you make a point not to choose yes men yep. you want people that will will confront you lovingly when they disagree mm -hmm. so that you can have a legitimate conversation discussion about what Ever the topic might be, so you can come to a conclusion based upon prayer and deliberation, mm -hmm. not just a bunch of people saying, oh, yeah, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. I saw that happen in the church I attended. Sure. You know, and some people do stir up strife. But, some do. But, but I, th I think what's happening here is this is a case of legitimate criticism and the scriptures being used selectively yes. to, to silence people. Yes. And that's what I find disturbing about this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another issue that came up is basically a conflict of interest. And if we can put up slide number 33, uh, page 14 of the report, would you mind reading that? All right. The report says, in 2017, the auditor highlighted as a significant deficiency that there were several instances of management overriding or circumventing controls that were in place to process payments or contracts outside established policies. Further, the report noted that there was the appearance of conflicts of interest with the president's son-in-law supervising a contract from which he benefits, as well as institutional aid being awarded to related parties exceeding typical award amounts. But there was no evidence at the time of the visit that these concerns had been addressed in more than a cursory manner. All right, let's put up slide number 34. And I want folks to see something. Uh, this individual is named Corey Welch. Mm -hmm. Corey Welch is married to Melinda Welch. And Melinda Welch's maiden name is Melinda MacArthur, mm -hmm. John MacArthur's daughter. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Corey Welch is John MacArthur's son-in-law, and he has several businesses related to graphics and that kind of thing. You know, uh, uh, the Welch Group, uh, WE Creative, and so forth. And he is also, the best we can tell, the COO of the Master's University and Seminary. So wow. he is, uh, money is coming from the school mm -hmm. to his business mm -hmm. that he himself, as an agent of the school, is supervising. Yeah. Now, folks, that is just a blatant uh, conflict of interest. Uh, that kind of thing should not be happening no. in any ministry. No. Absolutely. Um, and take a look at slide number 35. <laughs> this is money from their own 990s that's been documented. Slide number 35. Coming from... Number one, the school at the bottom. And number two, towards the top, one of John MacArthur's other uh, ministries, Grace to You, to Corey Welch and his businesses. Wow. Now, look, look at the total there at the bottom. It's close to $7 million. Wow. wow. I mean, you can't give the faculty a raise. 
you keep them below yeah. uh, the median in terms of salaries. You won't pay yeah. for their conferences right. for faculty enrichment. But some way, somehow, we've got $7 million yeah. coming from these entities to uh, Corey Welch, John MacArthur's son-in-law. And you can't and give discounts to the students for tuition, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> Exactly right. Holy cow. And folks, this is this is not rocket science. Man. Anybody with two brain cells to rub together <laughs> can see this is problematic. And it, and it took this uh, WASC accreditation group to bring all of these things to the surface. Well, thank God for them. And beyond that, if you go to slides 36, there from GTY is a loan. Actually, as I'm reading this, I don't even think it's a loan. Uh, I think the loan is forgiven over the course of a few years, mm -hmm. uh, but it's but it's a, and it's interest free mm -hmm. to the executive mm -hmm. director Phil mm -hmm. Johnson mm -hmm. to purchase a house. Say what in the neighborhood? To purchase of, a house in the neighborhood of fifty thousand dollars. Wow! I mean, that's what the tax records wow. demonstrated. Yeah, and there in fact, is. if you flashed forward to slide number thirty seven. <clears throat> Uh, what you'll see is this is a pattern, not just yeah. for Phil Johnson, but a bunch right. of other people yeah. within GTY. Mm -hmm. yeah. Grace to you. And so I'm, I'm just asking a question here. Mm. Do the donors to these ministries mm. understand that GTY and the Master's University and all of these entities are involved in the loaning business? Yeah. I mean, I thought that was the job of banks. Yeah. Um, beyond that, Phil Johnson's being paid a salary. Right. Why can't he purchase a house through his own salary? Right. And I think these are things that the public needs to understand yeah. before they start writing checks to this ministry. Well, that's right. That's right. Or any other ministry. Yeah. I mean, our books need to be out in the open, don't, don't they? Absolutely. And it's interesting that Phil Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, he's very aggressive on Twitter. To the point where, in my personal opinion, he comes across as very unchristlike. Mm -hmm. uh, I got into kind of a Twitter spat with him one time, and he called me uh, because of my Charles Ryrie soteriology. He called me antinomian. Yeah, and that's the kind of the name they they give to us when we don't march lockstep with their yeah. lordship salvation and their Calvinism. They call us antinomian against the law. Well, I'm not antinomian. Right. I believe in the law of Christ. Right. I believe in progressive sanctification, yes. etc. Well, my question to Phil Johnson is: Isn't this antinomian? What he's doing here? Hmm. Would this not be antinomian? I mean, this sure seems seems, like seems to me like it's against the law. Yeah. So you've got these bla blatant <clears throat> conflict of interest things going on. Yeah. We're getting close to wrapping up here, folks, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, if we go to slide number 38, you have non-normative processes <clears throat> of awarding degrees. Mm. Uh, take a look at slide 38 if you could. I think this is pages 15 and 16 of the WASC report. All right. Uh, the report says, of greatest concern within this standard are findings of non-normative processes for awarding some degrees, including doctorates. In the review process, team members triangulated data about reports of some being doctors or doctorates, be, or rather, of some being doctorates being, well, I'm not sure that's not written in there probably, some being doctors and being awarded on request of senior leadership by bypassing traditional autonomous faculty engagement. In one case, a student was awarded a PhD despite completing no coursework at the institution and bringing a dissertation that had not been approved by his prior European institution. And the reports are that the degree was approved prior to the dissertation being translated into English. Now stop right there. This really ticks me off. Yeah, I imagine. You know why? Because <clears throat> I actually went through the process and got the real PhD. Yeah. Asked my wife about it. Yeah. She was laboring, uh, yeah. actually in labor for I, part I of that. I remember. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And I was working on that PhD from what 2003 to 2009. Yeah. I had to do my clap coursework. I had to take my oral and written comps. Yep. And then I had to move into my dissertation phase, and it took me six and a half years, almost seven years, 
Seven years, by the way, is the same length as the Great Tribulation period. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> she, she did. She, she did. Yeah. That was and uh, by the behind the um, yeah. And, <laughs> and here's here's a guy that turns in a dissertation that's re rejected mm. in Europe. He turns it in here and he gets credit for it, and he doesn't no. have to do any coursework. Yeah, and nobody could read it because <laughs> it wasn't translated into English. Well, there we go. Uh, read the, read that final <laughs> sentence there, would you? After English. Uh, yeah, in another case, a student's faculty uh, graded final exam earned a failing grade, which resulted in a student appeal. Subsequently, another grader, other than the faculty member of record, submitted a passing grade for the student, which was officially recorded. These are outside academic norms raising significant questions about autonomous faculty roles being recognized. So you don't pass the course from one teacher, you just submit it to someone else who yeah. wasn't the teacher of the course, yeah. and they just they just wave you arbitrarily right on through. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now, John MacArthur is calling this whole thing a lie. And that's what you have to figure out. Who's really telling the truth here? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the WASC people have to gain by bringing all this out into the mm -hmm. surface uh, other than wanting to keep accreditation standards high. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to believe that with the whole process that they went through that the whole WASP report is part of a, a, a conspiracy. Right. It, it just doesn't right. pass the smell test to yeah. me. Um, if you can take a look at slide number 39, it continues on with these non-normative academic processes, page 24 of the WASP report. Says further reports of administrative intrusion in academic decisions, including bringing in an individual with a newly completed doctorate into a first time faculty role at associate professor level, pressing for, re uh, for regrading of a, final ex a failing exam and substituting a staff grade for that by the professor of record and bypassing faculty input on awarding of several doctorate degrees are outside the reasonable and ordinary practices of faculty academic leadership. So there's a process you go through. You start off as, and I, I went through this process seven years at the accredited Bible college I, yeah. I worked at. You start yeah. off as an assistant professor, and then mm -hmm. you become an associate professor, and then eventually you become a full full professor. You don't start someone uh, right yeah. away, PhD in hand, at a higher rank you than just others. Just leapfrog that first Le level. Leapfrog, right? yeah. <clears throat> so the whole thing you know, doesn't make sense at all. And um, if we can go here to slide uh, number 40, pages 17 and 18 of the WASC report, you've got the chief operating officer uh, acknowledging that he's unfamiliar with the basic regulations and laws that govern colleges. Good question. Uh, um, Do I really have to read this? Okay. <laughs> Nor was the chief operating officer familiar with mandated higher education policies and procedures, nor required reporting of related consumer data. In the context of contemporary life, the absence of trained personnel to appropriately respond to sexual assault claims in a judicious and supportive environment is troubling. At the seminary, the dean of students serves as the designated Title IX administrator. The seminary website lacks the mandated Title IX and Clary reports. The Graduate Student Handbook contains a link to the university's Higher Education Opportunity Act page, which has links to Title IX reporting. But one must search the Education Department's website to obtain current reports. And then take a look at slide 41, page 19, and I'll try to explain this a little bit. The institution sustained significantly higher turnover in the executive management level as well as many staff positions. The AVT was informed and observed there is a culture and climate of fear, intimidation, bullying, and uncertainty. Isn't that, isn't that interesting how that over keeps coming and over up. and over and yeah. over, which was ascribed to the newly appointed management team. Further reports from the confidential emails raised notable concerns, including the potential for lack of fidelity to a number of key policies, including the Whistleblowers Act. Wow. Now, let's, it mentions here <clears throat> FERPA. Now, I know, I know something about FERPA because uh, 
you know, of the accredited school that I worked at for a number of years. Uh, FERPA is federal legislation governing student privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you can't post students' grades on the door yeah. like the old days. The old days, right. You can't yeah. call out people's quiz scores. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't even have students change exchange right. papers yeah. to uh, grade for grading yeah, they, they purposes. Grade yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. all of that is governed by FERPA. And at the school I was at, FERPA was drilled into our heads all of the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because our school, rightfully, didn't want to be in violation of FERPA. Mm -hmm. Now, here comes the CEO, the chief operating officer, who, as best I can tell, is this Corey Welch, who, by the way, is supervising a contract that he's benefiting from, mm -hmm. which we already covered. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's asked mm -hmm. about FERPA by the WASC people. He doesn't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, that, to me, is astounding. Mm -hmm. And he apparently didn't know anything mm -hmm. about something called VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, another piece of federal yeah. legislation. Now, why is VAWA so important? Because, and now listen to me very carefully, folks, there was an allegation oh, yes. probably about 12 years ago at, at this school related mm -hmm. to rape. Yes. Now, I want to emphasize allegation. allegation. I don't know all the details. I've heard a lot of conflicting reports. But whenever you deal with the subject of rape, you got to, and that's uh, in in the background somewhere. Mm -hmm. Even if these folks were completely innocent, mm -hmm. you've got to know exactly what VAWA is. Yes, you do. Uh, you've got to be on the ball, yes. and there's a lack of familiarity with yeah. VAWA, and you've got the chief operating officer unfamiliar with the basic regulations and laws governing. Um, colleges and beyond that you've got no full-time chief operating officer chief executive officer and chief financial officer in other words those are all separate offices with separate functions that require three full-time people yeah. and the best i can tell is you've got one full-time person mm -hmm. Co covering mm -hmm. one of those roles. Mm -hmm. So they flag this as well. Yeah. And uh, notice, if you will, pages, I'm sorry, this would be slides number 42 and 43. Uh, let's do 42 first, pages right. 23 and 24 of the report. All right. The Master's University and Seminary, this is the report now, has not adhered to the clearly stated WSCUC standard that accredited institutions have a full-time CEO and full-time CFO. Specifically, the president, CEO, and the CFO hold significant roles and responsibilities at other organizations. The standard requires these officers' primary or full-time responsibilities to be to the institution. Further, the expectation of Standard 3.8 for sufficient qualified administrators is not fully realized in the new leadership ranks with some alarming reports. With the recent turnover of cabinet-level leaders, most of the new team are recent alumni of the institution and lack higher education experience or connection to professional associations or peers in similar professional roles. In most cases, recent senior leaders have dual pastoral university seminary roles and lack higher education experience beyond student ranks. So what do you have? Let's see. Did you read slide 43? Well, let me go on now. Yep. Let me read 43. Yeah. Continue. Sadly, the institution may not be able to regain its balance without deep and significant changes. Similarly, the lack of fidelity to WSCUC's requirement for an accredited institution to have a full-time president and CFO will likely require some further level of leadership transition. We need a CEO, we need a COO, and we need a CFO. How's that for alphabet soup? There you go. And what's <clears throat> happening is one of the three, the best I can tell, is being filled by a, a, a full-timer. Mm -hmm. And even in that, there's a conflict of interest, the yes. best I can tell. Yeah. And what the what Master Seminary has been trying to say for a long time is, well, John MacArthur is filling the, those roles. Yeah. 
Well, John MacArthur is the senior pastor of what, a 15,000 member church yeah. called uh, uh, Grace, Grace Community yeah. Church. Mm -hmm. And he's also uh, heading up, in, to some extent, a radio ministry. Mm -hmm. So how is John MacArthur supposed to fill all three of those roles? Right. I mean, he would have to work 24-7, yeah. which would be impossible. Right. And so you can do it this way if you're not under accreditation. Mm -hmm. But these yeah, folks have chosen to pursue accreditation, and consequently they're not following the standards of accreditation. Right. You see that? Right. And this is not the devil doing this stuff to these people. Yeah, and I think maybe we should add it just quickly here that, yeah. that in order for the institution to become accredited in the first place, they had to be meeting all of these criteria. Mm -hmm. So here this here this uh, group comes back in, and I don't know, I, you know, I know that generally every ten years you have to go come under review for accreditation. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this is part of that, but but at one point in time, supposedly they were meeting all of these, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden something's happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. they were flagged mm -hmm. by some of these things early on in the process mm -hmm. a few years back, and mm -hmm. they basically, from what I can tell from the WASP report, chose just, to ignore, maybe they ignore, just ignore, them. ignore yeah. those warnings. Well, there you go. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're above the law. Boy, that's, that's right. That's very important to understand. That's right. Uh, John MacArthur, in his chapel address to the students, October 21st, says at the 41-minute mark, another accusation is that we don't have a full-time COO. He says, completely false. I've never been more involved than I am. But you have to understand, I'm not really necessary inside the institution. That was another way to fire at me. Hmm. So it's all about him mm -hmm. yeah. and an alleged personal attack on him. Right. When in reality, any, anybody with common sense could see there's no way he could fulfill mm -hmm. senior pastor role mm -hmm. and a CEO role with, without working 24-7. Which yeah. would be impossible, right? So you know, John MacArthur is just denying this whole thing, yeah. And folks have to decide what, who they believe, yeah. the Wasp Report or John mm -hmm. MacArthur. Now there are people that will say John MacArthur has done more for Christianity than anybody since the apostles, yeah. Like Justin Peters, yeah. Obviously, people like that can't be convinced of anything, right? But uh, I think people that actually are analyzing this carefully and deciding where to send their money. You know, can discern these things, and yes. and we're and that's why we started with First John four one. Right. Test the spirits. That, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But you were going to say something. No, no, no. I, I'm just. And you know, <laughs> the very last thing, and this is the last thing on my list, is uh, you've got unqualified personnel at the administrative level. If we can put up slide forty. Four, which is something I believe that we have actually yeah, we've read. Uh, read before. Um, as you get into that second sentence, it says, um, you mind reading that second underlined sentence there? Sure. With the recent turnover of cabinet level leaders, most of the new team are recent alumni of the institution and lack higher education experience or connection to professional associations or peers in similar professional roles. In most cases, recent senior leaders have dual pastor seminary university roles and lack higher education experience beyond student ranks. Yeah. So you've got a case of dual roles with the church, yeah. and you've also got a scenario where you've got people being promoted yeah. um, to the highest levels that really don't have the competence to be there. Yeah. Uh, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, I don't know if it's necessary that we read all these, but we've got slides 46, 47, 48, and 49 that are just sort of reviewing everything mm -hmm. that we've covered. Yeah. Uh, rather than reading all that material, let me just review very quickly the, the 12 points or so that, that has been highlighted by the WASC report. Number one, a high volume of anonymous emails. Yeah. Number two, a high volume of personnel transitions, particularly recently. Number three, a lack of faculty independence. Number four, dual areas of responsibility with the church, which means if I step out of line at the school, I might be punished at the church. Yeah. Number five, a lack of board independence. <clears throat> Number six, favoritism in tuition 
uh, calculations. Number seven, a climate. This is the one that bothers me the yes. most. A climate yeah. of bullying, fear, <clears throat> and intimidation. Yes. Number eight, a major conflict of interest regarding the president's son-in-law. Yeah. And him supervising a contract that he personally benefits yes. from in the amount of when you look at all the figures, about seven million dollars. Yeah. And that was in twenty sixteen. Yeah, yeah, we didn't even have the most recent no, have, uh, yeah. things. <clears throat> Number nine, non-normative processes in terms of awarding degrees. Number ten, a lack of familiarity with the laws and regulations that govern colleges and seminaries. Number eleven, playing sort of a charade with. Uh, three offices that need yeah. to be staffed each by a full-time person yeah. and number 12 at the highest administrative levels you have unqualified people um, you know wow. I, I think something like this uh, doesn't just hurt them I think it hurts Christianity it does and we could do that here at Sugarland Bible Church, too, couldn't yeah, we? We could we, mess up something yeah. and bring down the body of Christ. Yes. And this is one of the reasons that we bring these things to your attention. Um, I think that if we're honest, the Bible and the real world gives us examples of what to do yes. and what not to do. Right. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk <clears throat> about this. It's not to profit somehow. From what's happening there, it's a, it's an example for all of us to learn from, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope people don't necessarily get mad at us. We're just reading objective information right. and right. testing the spirits the way the Bible That's, tells us to do it, yes. even when it happens to be someone within <clears throat> our Christendom circles that happens to be very popular and have a large following. No one's I, above the law. I've done an awful lot of talking, Jim. What do you do? You have any? Well, I just was noticing. I would really encourage people to go to the link and look at the report, and go to the end and look at the recommendations that the team makes. And I think you'll find those very insightful. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Just a few questions and comments that came in. Could this possibly be part of their salary package? Maybe so. And that's why we're just a asking yeah. questions here. Right. But you need to ask the questions. That, that's right. Yes. Another person says mixed emotions, that's how I feel about it, is a good way to describe the struggle on this. And another person says this is really well done and great to see. We all need to look at ourselves humbly like this. Yes. And if that had been done there, uh, they could have avoided some of these findings. Yeah. yeah so. There go I but for the grace of God. That's right. Okay. Another person says two of my favorite pastors are Hibbs and Farag, and they are both Calvary Chapel. That's why I was sort of put off a little bit by John MacArthur's latter, more recent statements, mm -hmm. uh, putting down not just some of the aberrations within Calvary Chapel, but the foundation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And if you listen yeah. to his comments very quickly, he was going after the foundation. Yes. Another person says, thank you for keeping us educated on these matters. That's why we're here. We're not here just to repeat what everybody else is saying. We're here to bring to you stuff that uh, Don't no, have to worry about that. no one necessarily <laughs> is talking about. Another person says, a pervasive culture of fear and intimidation and bullying, a sad state of affairs. Another person says, thank you so much to raise this issue, uh, Pastor Andy and Pastor Jim. Yeah. Well, do you have any... Uh, Concluding comments or thoughts on this sort of sad day as we look at this subject? Well, I, I think we need to we need to pray for John MacArthur. Yeah. We need to pray for his ministry and the people that have been harmed by it, apparently, from this report. There are a lot of people out there right now that I know are hurting because of what transpired in their lives, mm -hmm. because of their involvement with the seminary there, et cetera. And again, I have personal experience with people involved in the Word Faith movement to this very day who are wounded and hurt and are not getting the healing that they need. And we need to look for those people and pray for them and encourage them and appoint them to a church that's going to stand for truth and, uh, you know, let God do what He wants to do. Yeah, and, and not just stand for truth, but but order our finances yes, and our lives. Absolutely. And we all mess up. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. But the best we know how to <clears throat> under, under God. Yeah. We, we've got to do better if, if we're going to impact this culture yes. for Christ. Yes. Well, if you agree with this message, I'd invite you to share this on Facebook. You may not want to do that because you might get some black eyes. <laughs>
Yeah. And um, also, we want to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just go to Andy Woods, either Pastor's Point of View or Pastor's Perspective, and subscribe, and um, uh, you'll get a free notification every time we post something. Right. This presentation will be posted up on YouTube uh, very quickly. And we apologize for having gone on a little longer than we normally go. Uh, but we felt it was necessary that we actually communicate the information as it's written in these formal documents, and that and that requires documentation yeah. and carefully reading long, boring legal paragraphs. Right. So at this point, we're going to sign off, and we love you. We'll pray. We pray for you, and we ask that you'll pray for us as well. God bless you. God bless.